right. Amen. I'm going to scoot this back. I keep hearing a ringing when I step forward. Open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll be in verses 14 and the fall to 22, and I will read that for us when you get there in a moment. First Corinthians 10, chapter, First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14 says this, so then, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I am speaking as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I am saying. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, since all of us share the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? What am I saying then? That food sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but I do say that what they sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot share in the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or are we provoking the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? There are not many things that I think Hollywood does better than Christians. (laughs) I think we can all agree with that. That that if we were to look at Hollywood and, and the entertainment industry, we can see a lot of problems. But I do think that they have one part that they get a little bit more right than most Christians do, and that is understanding that demons are real. And and we could see this every year, especially during this time, how many movies come out that portray not so accurately, but at least they're portraying that there's something out there, that there's some kind of demonic spirit and influence. I mean, thousands of movies have been created where there is something going on that's tormenting people and bringing about all sorts of wickedness and evil. They do that. They, they show that. Whether they actually believe it or not, I don't know. But at least they talk about it. And I think the church suffers because we kind of push it to the side. We don't really want to bring it up. It's, it's awkward. It's weird. What do you mean when you talk about demons? But here, how many times did Paul reference demons? At least three. I didn't count, but I'm pretty sure it was at least three. Hollywood does get it wrong, though. (laughs) They do portray them wrongly more often than not. They have them sort of like, well, your house is haunted by this demon, and it's just seeking to devour and to, to just oppress in a really physical and outward way. That may happen occasionally. Not saying your house is haunted, but... I don't think that's how demons operate. If demons are real, which they are according to Scripture, I don't think they're very obvious about it. I don't think it's so in your face so that you know, okay, that's a demon that's doing this to me. They go about it in more subtle ways. It's more subtle than that. It's not going to be just in your face, I'm persecuting you. That's what we see in the text. It's more subtle. Paul brings up demons, but he he doesn't bring it up as if they are actively trying to physically harm and destroy these these believers. 
It's more subtle than that. They do it through a meal. They try to turn these believers' eyes off of Christ and onto anything else. They do it through a meal, a meal that comes across as a celebration. This is a good thing. Look at all the people that are gathered around to partake of this meal that was, yeah, I guess it was sacrificed to that idol over there, but but if we just ignore that part, we can still join in the celebration, right? Comes across as a positive and a, a good thing. But Paul, however, is going to reveal that these meals are anything but good. And for a Christian, they ought to be avoided completely. They ought to be avoided, one, because they are already invited to another and better meal. We participate and and join in a better meal than the one that these temples were providing but also because although they seem innocent enough, what is going on under the surface is blatant idolatry. And Paul, seeing this, he he brought it up in chapter 8, two chapters ago, but he's been, this, this whole idea of idolatry and meat sacrificed to idols has been under the surface this entire time. Until now, we kind of get to a head. And he says, flee idolatry. Paul begins the passage this morning by giving them a charge as his dear friends. They are not just merely acquaintances. They are not just someone he has to correct and write to. They are his dear friends. He loves them, and because he loves them, he urges them, please flee idolatry. We've seen this charge before regarding sexual immorality and the firmness is the same in both charges. Paul is saying you need to run as far and as fast as you can from both of them. Flee. Fleeing is not just a casual walking away. Fleeing is a sprint. It's for your life you're running. There are deceptive and dangerous things that are going on in these meals, these offerings, these sacrifices, and they ensnare many people and cause them to become idolaters. These Corinthians must flee. And one of the things they must do to flee from it is to stop participating in the celebration of it. They cannot eat the meat that's been sacrificed to idols. Paul started this argument again in chapter 8. He said, don't eat that meat for the sake of your brothers and sisters because they will stumble. But now he gets more down to the, the root issue. You don't eat the meat because you're participating with demons when you do this. And so he says... See for yourself. I'm speaking to you as sensible people. You should be able to understand what I'm trying to communicate to you. Judge for yourselves what I'm saying. Interestingly, though, Paul doesn't in the passage go straight into the main topic of of this idle food, but takes a detour. And again, as I mentioned, starts with a meal that is more positive and one they should partake of, one they should participate in, and that's the Lord's Supper. So he contrasts the Lord's Supper and this meal where there's idols being worshipped. And he says, eat this one, don't eat this one. One of these meals promotes good things while the other provokes bad things happening. And so we're going to look at them in the order Paul puts them forward. First, we'll look at the meal that promotes the Lord's Supper. This is verses 16 and 17. Read it with me again. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, since all of us share the one bread. Bread. He's putting forth the Lord's Supper. That's the meal they should participate in. And this meal promotes 
It promotes the gospel of Jesus Christ. The life and the death of Christ. When we eat it, that's what we're proclaiming. That's what we're remembering. It promotes participation in the blessing he gives through that gospel that's proclaimed. It's not merely an act that's been done to someone else or to to some other degree. No, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're participating in the blessing that we get to remember what Christ has done for us. The blessing where we share in his body and blood that was broken and shed for us. The body and the blood that gave us forgiveness of our sins. The body and the blood that gave us the righteousness of Christ. The body and the blood that gave us eternal life in Christ. The body and the blood that is the only reason that we are able to have the Spirit dwell in us. The body and the blood that gives us the right to be called sons and daughters of God. The body and the blood that reveals that our God loves us in an unending way. And it reveals so much more. That's the meal that we ought to partake of. That's the meal that he wants them to take more seriously. Eat this meal. Eat this bread. Drink this cup. It promotes our remembrance and our participation in the blessing Christ has given us. But it also promotes participation with the body. Paul puts forward the Lord's Supper as not an individual thing only. It's not as if when we take the Lord's Supper or when they take the Lord's Supper that they're, they're getting by themselves and they're thinking only about themselves. That's why when we take the Lord's Supper, we pass it out and we wait to take it together at the same time. We take the bread and we eat it together. We take the cup and we drink it together because that bread and that cup brought us together. That's why we are a body. We all share the one bread who is Christ and because of that we are made to be one body in Him. The Christian life has never and will never be a lone life. It promotes the reality that When we take this meal, we have been placed together with our brothers and sisters in Christ in this local body. That he has called us out of the world and he has gathered us together here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And that together we make up the body of Christ that we participate in. Again, there is biblically no such thing as a lone Christian or a churchless Christian. The whole New Testament is the Gospels where Christ died to to birth the church and he was resurrected to birth the church and then the rest of it in Acts and the following is the gathering of the church and how to live in light of the church and together as the church. And so this is what the meal promotes. You need one another. Paul says, you need one another. The Bible doesn't have a category for a Christian who is not joined to a local church body where Christ is proclaimed and the supper is shared. It has to go together. And the outcome of eating this meal, the meal that promotes, is the promotion of unity in the body. That we are one, truly. Not just many gathering in one place, but we are one in Christ. We build one another up. We work together to move closer and closer to the image of Christ. That's what Paul gets at in Ephesians 4. That you work together as every individual member of the body comes together and works together for the building up of the body of Christ in love so that we look like Christ. So we ought to eat this meal. They ought to eat this meal The meal that promotes our union with Christ, our union together, the blessings that we have because Christ's body was broken and his blood was shed. But then he moves on. 
Eat that meal. Now, don't eat this one. The meal that provokes. This meal that has this, these meats sacrificed to idols. We see this in verses 18 to 22. Paul begins in 18 by turning back to Israel, where we were for the large part of last week remembering all of what they did that caused them to be destroyed in the wilderness. And he turns back and he says, they participated in the offerings of the altar. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? He's pointing back to the golden calf where they were just brought out of slavery in Egypt went through the Red Sea on dry ground. It closed and destroyed their enemies. They're walking under the cloud as God leads them by day and by night. And then they turn to this golden calf that they made out of the gold that God gave them when they left. And it says last week that they what does it say that they did? They sat down to eat and drink and they got up to party. They sacrificed to this golden calf. They said, this is our God who led us out of Egypt, and they sacrificed to it and partook of the sacrifice. And it's not as if they could say, well, it's just food, because if you eat the meat and the food that was sacrificed, you participate in what it was sacrificed to, an idol. And so he brings that up. Learn from them again. He continues on and repeats what he affirmed in chapter 8. Now, don't get me wrong, basically, is what he's saying. Idols are nothing, and food is food, but what happens when you eat that food is that you participate in the idol they're worshiping as well. I know that he's essentially saying, I know that the truth is That idol is nothing, and that food is just food. It doesn't make you closer to God by eating it or not eating it. But if you knowingly eat it, then you're participating in what they're doing. You participate in the worship of whatever idol that temple is for. And then he gets down to the the real issue at hand, this idol worship is not really worshiping the idol because the idol is nothing, but it's worshiping demons who have set up these idols, who have deceived people to think that these gods are real. They've deceived people into believing that they're worshiping a real God when the truth is there is no God but one. So Paul says when you eat at the table of these idols, you're eating not at the table of real gods, but of demons, those who desire you to worship anything but the one true God. And what does this do? What's the outcome of this, of dining at these temples, of dining at these tables of demons? It provokes the Lord to jealousy. He alone is to be worshipped. And to provoke him is to find out what Israel found out, that he is much stronger than they are. That if you worship these idols, you follow these false gods, you get into bed with demons, you will be destroyed. Judgment will come. God is stronger than these Corinthians and he's stronger than us today. Paul gives the clear truth that you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. They are not compatible. You cannot participate in the blessings of the Lord's Supper and at the same time participate with demons. It does not work. And again, as I said when we first brought this up in chapter 8, we don't really have this issue today as far as being tempted to eat food that's been sacrificed to an idol. 
We don't have these temples all around where people are actively bringing their offerings and sacrifices and then throwing this celebration where, where people can come and take part in meat and food sacrifice to an idol. We don't really have that going on. I'm not saying that there's nowhere that that happens. There's probably some places where you can go that would fit that, but by and large, we just don't have that issue. We're not really tempted to go and to eat in a temple of another false god. It doesn't happen. So what do we do with this? Do we just ignore it and say, well, that was their problem. We don't have that problem today. No, no. We certainly have the same problem that they had, even though it looks a little bit different. There's still this reality that we can seek to participate in that which provokes the Lord, that leads to us being idolaters. We still struggle with idolatry today, even if it looks different than it did then. Because guess what? Demons are still real. There is still this reality that we are fighting a spiritual battle. That there are spiritual powers of darkness at work. And that's who we fight against. That's why Paul is so serious in Ephesians 6. Put on the full armor of God. So that you can stand against them. And if they're real, still today, then don't be so naive to to think that they're not actively trying to do the same thing that they were doing then. Trying to get the people of God and the people that are lost to take their eyes off of Him. To don't worship Him. Don't follow His ways. Do anything else but that. That certainly still happens today. And they are still just as subtle today as they were then disguising things to look as if they are good and right, but really they are wrong and damning. They tempt us towards idolatry in many ways still today, but we must, like these Corinthians, flee idolatry. We must flee it. We must not partake of the meals of our day that provoke the Lord to jealousy. We must Flee idolatry by clinging to what is good and that which promotes the reality of our union with Christ and our union with the church. We must partake of the things that promote our sharing in the blessing which Christ has given us. And here's how we do it. We flee idolatry when we distance ourselves from that which rouses sin in us and provokes the Lord to jealousy. When we distance ourselves from that which causes us to sin. Things that often rouse us to sin and provoke God to jealousy are that which demons would have us run towards. What they want us to look at. What they want us to participate in. One of those things is busyness. We can think that being busy is a good thing. You're not being slothful. You're not being idle. You're, you're doing all of these things, right? That's a good thing. But where it turns to a bad thing is when we get so busy that we start thinking, well, I can't gather with the people of God. I've got this going on. Well, I can't go make disciples. I can't evangelize. I've got to go do this. I've got this big project coming up. I've got to focus on that. Well, I can't get into the Word. I'm too busy and I'm so tired by the end of the day. I can't open His Word and and learn what He has for us. Busyness can be an idol. And I think that that's one of the greatest things that demons in the spiritual world, world use today to distract even Christians. We get so caught up in all of the the details of life and all the things that we need to do on our calendar and we fill it up so that we think we're doing good things. But if it distracts us from worship, if it distracts us from the important things of the Lord, then that's an issue. They can cause us to abandon the Scriptures. That's a huge one today. 
If, if they can get people to start thinking the Bible isn't relevant, I don't need to read it, then that's going to cause us to turn to idolatry and run towards sin. If they can get us to say, the Bible is not trustworthy, there's errors in it, which there's not. It's going to lead us to idolatry, away from the Lord. If they start to convince us that the Bible isn't sufficient, that we need something else, that this isn't enough, it's going to lead us to idolatry. Whatever that something else is will become our idol. Prayerlessness. We think, well, I don't, I, I'll figure it out. I don't, I don't need to take this to the Lord. It's minor. I can handle it on my own. You're the idol in that case. I am big enough to handle this problem on my own. I don't need the Lord. That's what they would have us believe. Self-centered worship. This is a big one. I'm not going to go to that church if it doesn't have what I like. If the style isn't the one I want. If the instruments that I like aren't there or there's other ones that I don't like. The songs that I like. It's either got to be hymns or nothing. It's got to be contemporary or nothing. The singers that I like. Well, if that person's not leading worship today, then there's no point in me going. As if that's the point. As if we gather to be entertained or to be appeased instead of gathering to worship the Lord. We're not worshiping our preferences or ourselves. We're worshiping the Almighty God. Love of money is a big one. If I can just get a little bit more, I can just have this, then I can buy what I want. And if I buy what I want, I'll be happy. I'll be content. I'll be, I'll be good. selfishness it's my stuff I need that I can't give it to someone else they didn't earn it it's mine pride I deserve this why didn't I get it or look how generous I am look how good I am the Lord is lucky to have me disunity man we can be so distracted by so many things and be torn apart because we are looking at the wrong things centered on worldly things things that will pass away instead of eternal things that which lasts forever We can diminish the centrality of Jesus and the gospel by turning our attention to good works as our justification. They would love us. The, the powers of darkness would love us to be a people that start to work for our salvation. And if I could just be good enough and I could do just enough good things to outweigh all of the bad things that I've done, then I can make it. That's not true Christianity. Or if we turn our attention in the church to good works as the sole purpose of the church. We exist just to do good deeds. That's missing the point. We exist for the glory of God. We exist to bring Him glory, honor, and praise by doing good works. But the good works are not the main thing. We do them for His glory and in response to the Goodness that he's shown us in the grace of the Lord. And then the last one, which we're going to get to again later on in 1 Corinthians, treating the Lord's Supper lightly. I mean, that's the meal he says we ought to eat. But we start to turn towards sin and to run towards idolatry when we start to... It's just something we do once a quarter fine it's fine if I miss it 
It's fine if I take it wrongly. It's, I mean, it's just a little wafer and it's just a little cup of juice. That's, there's no significance in that. That's running towards sin. That's provoking the Lord to jealousy. Something that they learned all too well. So we, we flee those things. We distance ourselves from those things. But we don't just do that. We don't just run from things. We run to things. We flee idolatry when we run to and we partake of the things that promote our sharing in the blessing which Christ has given us. When we take the Lord's Supper rightly, when we remember the blessing that Christ has given us through his death on the cross, when we make that not just something we do, but a central thing that we do, that we were commanded to do, it proclaims the Lord's death. We look forward to his return when we take it. So we partake of things that promote our sharing in the blessing. Things that often promote the reality of our union with Christ and his church are those things that demons would have us flee from, not flee to. Things like gathering. We have to gather, not to earn favor with God, but to be godly. To be faithful, we've got to gather. And here's my encouragement, my strong encouragement. If you are only gathering in this setting, in this service, please seek at least one other time to gather with the body of Christ. Because yes, you can gain a lot in this one hour and 15 minute time together. But what happens in the middle of the week when something comes up, you're tempted or or some distress happens and you haven't gathered in six days with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're going to be tempted to all of those other things. Prayerlessness, thinking I can handle it on my own, thinking I'm a Lone Ranger Christian, But if you were with them Sunday and you were with them Wednesday, you remember, I am not alone. The Lord has given me my church family to help me through this, to help me remain faithful in this problem, in this difficulty. So we gather. That's how we flee idolatry. And when we gather, we remember why we gather. It's to worship the Lord. We flee towards prayer. We've got to be a praying people. That's why we have that prayer time in the middle of the service because too often prayer is just used as a uh, a transition moment in a service. Well, we we read the scripture. Now we're going to pray so that we can get into the singing, which we don't believe that, but this is what happens. And then at the end of the sermon, we pray so that someone can come up so that we can sing. And then at the end of the service, we pray so that we can be dismissed. And that's all it ever is. It's just a transition. But that's why we intentionally put, this is the time we are going to intentionally pray to pray. For specific things going on in your life, for things going on in the world, in the life of our brothers and sisters. Because we need the Lord to act, to be a part of it. We run to singing. We sing for a reason, not just because, well, it's good to sing songs together. No, we sing because those songs proclaim the glory of God. They teach us the truths of Scripture. They remind us of the goodness of the gospel. We seem to be reminded of it so that we flee idolatry and stay and hold fast to the Lord. We give. We give of our time and we also give of our money. We are to be generous both to those made in God's image, to our brothers and sisters in Christ, to those in need. If we have, we ought to give. We give to the church as well so that the 
church of God can continue forward and disciples can be made and we can grow in godliness. And as an act of obedience, as an act of being faithful that the Lord gave me this, I'm going to give it to him back. I'm merely a steward. It's not mine anyway. We flee idolatry when we make disciples, when we evangelize, when we go share the gospel with others. We go tell them of the love of Jesus. We go tell them of that which we celebrate in the Lord's Supper, that Christ died for them. His body was broken for them. His blood was shed on the cross for them. For their sins, Christ died. But not only evangelism, when we engage in discipleship, which is the second half of making disciples. Yes, we go share the gospel, but if they believe, we train them in the word. We teach them what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. We teach them everything Jesus commanded. That is how we resist idolatry and flee idolatry. We saturate ourselves in the scriptures. We read it, yes, but not just to read it. We study it. What does this mean? That's why we just started on Wednesday nights. How do we read the Bible? How do we understand it? How do we apply it to our life? We meditate on it so that when those temptations come up, we have a defense. That's what Jesus gave us the example of when he was tempted in the wilderness. If you just bow down to me and worship me, I'll give you everything you want, Jesus. He said, no, because it is written, we must worship God alone. We make much of Jesus. When we make much of Jesus, it's hard to make much of anything else. If we make much of Jesus, those idols are going to seem small and, and worthless like they really are. When we're unified, we flee idolatry. Because when we're unified, those things that we can have disagreements on, such as worship style and music and what translation we use and, and all of those other things, become diminished. Because the point is that we're worshiping the Lord. And we want to do that together. Because He's brought us together. And again, we take the Lord's Supper. We take that cup. And we look at that bread. And we know that, that, yes, that isn't Christ's body, but it reminds me of Christ's body. That Christ was whipped and beaten and spat on and nailed to a cross. A spear in his side where blood and water poured out. Why? Because of me. For me and for you. That that cross, that wooden cross was stained in blood so that it would wash us clean, white as snow. We, we eat of the meals that promote good things for us, that help us to flee idolatry. And we abstain from the meals that make us into idolaters. Because church, we cannot share in the Lord's table and the table of demons. We can't. They're incompatible. So let us choose the meals that promote godliness, not the meals that provoke the Lord to jealousy and bring about destruction. The Lord is worthy to be praised. There is no God but one. Let us worship him and nothing else. Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful for the cross. We are grateful for the picture we get and the reminder that we get in the Lord's Supper. Help us to flee idolatry at all costs to not even flirt with it, to not even be near it, but to flee it and to run towards that which builds us up, which promotes godliness. 
Let us be in your word. Let us gather together. Let us be in prayer constantly. Let us make much of Jesus. And God, if there's someone here this morning who doesn't know you, who's been so enamored with idols and idolatry that they've been deceived, that their eyes have been blinded by the the father of lies, I pray that you would open their eyes to your goodness, to the gospel, to their need for it. That they would flee idolatry as they see how much more worthy you are to run towards. God, help us here at Emmanuel Baptist to constantly be on the lookout for areas that we have started to drift. I've started to make much of something else. Bring us back to where we ought to be, centering on you, Jesus, and your gospel and the pursuit of making disciples of all nations living faithfully to you, being obedient to what you have commanded us to do. God, we can't do it on our own. We need you. We need your spirit to move in us and among us. And we are grateful that you have done just that and that we look forward to you continuing to do that. So Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.